So by means of introduction this afternoon, I'd like to tell you a little bit of a story. Now I have a friend uh, who grew up in the church who suffers from a bit of a medical condition. So she has uh, low blood sugar. She's prone to having low blood sugar. And so it can be challenging for her to keep up her energy throughout the day. You know, she generally has to keep eating something every couple of hours or otherwise she's gonna feel very faint or very woozy. And I think even when she wakes up in the morning, she's gotta eat something fairly quickly, you know, a half hour or an hour of waking up just to make sure she has the energy to get her day started correctly. Now, this isn't to say her life is miserable by any means or that she's, you know, unable to function in life or anything. She leaves a very active lifestyle, but it does come with some limitations. She's got to be aware of her surroundings and just, you know, be aware of what's going on with her as well as being prepared for all sorts of occasions. Got to make sure the purse is filled with an adequate supply of snacks and all that good stuff. Now, of course, we recently went through the fall Holy Day season. And right before we went off to the feast this year, we all observed the Day of Atonement, as did my friend. Now, my friend's condition, along with her desire to worship God and worship his commandments, was on her mind. You know, we are to fast during the Day of Atonement, but my friend has never been able to complete a full 24-hour fast due to this condition. And even a partial fast, however long she was able to fast for, leaves her feeling pretty miserable. And so it seems that physically for her, that 24-hour fast that we all take for granted being able to do might not be possible for her. In our lives, it's easy for us to think about our desires our prayers, our hopes, or even our dreams in terms of what is physically possible, even when we have a relationship with God. It's not that we don't believe that God has power or God has influence in our lives, but it's easy to consider things in terms of possibilities that we can conceive of, what seems possible to us. In a sense, if we can't work out a solution to a particular problem, it can be easy to lose hope or lose faith. Just as an example, let's consider how the nation of Israel might have felt as they were fleeing from Pharaoh's army. So let's turn over to Exodus 14 this morning, or afternoon, I almost said morning. Mm. <laughs> Exodus 14, and we'll start uh, in verse 10, and we'll read just a handful of verses here. Exodus 14, and we'll start in verse 10. Now, Israel had been promised deliverance from Egypt, from captivity. But then in verse 10, And when Pharaoh drew near, and the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians that we should, than that we should die in the wilderness. The Israelites, who had just seen the miracles performed by God in Egypt, were still thinking in physical terms. They'd seen all these plagues that had come down on the Egyptians from God himself, and they were still thinking in physical terms. They themselves couldn't think of a way out of this situation. They were stuck between the oncoming Pharaoh's army and, of course, the sea. And so even though they were promised deliverance, it seemed like they would surely die. They possibly even lost faith, because it seemed like their deliverance was now impossible. And we see another example in the New Testament, a little bit less is at stake here, when the Virgin Mary was told that she was to give birth to Jesus the Christ, even though she was a virgin. Now let's read a little bit of this account over in Luke, and we'll start in Luke chapter 1. We'll start in verse 30. Luke chapter 1, verse 30. 
Then an angel said to her, speaking to Mary, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now Luke 1 and verse 34, Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? Again, these things seemed physically impossible, both as to how Israel could escape the Egyptians or how Mary could conceive a child. The people involved hadn't worked out in their minds how these things could happen. They didn't see how God could operate within the physical laws to make these things he had promised come about. This way of thinking, however, doesn't consider all of God's capabilities. In our minds, if we think in this way, we have imposed human limitations on God's powers. It's easy for us to think in physical terms, being that we are physical and we do physical things, and it's easy for us to think about things that we can ourselves reason about. But we have not been called by a God who is limited to what we can do, to what we think is possible. God can certainly do marvelous works, of course, within the physical laws that he himself created. But however, if it is his will, he can also operate outside of those restrictions. And this key concept is stated very succinctly just a couple of verses down here in Luke 1 and verse 37. For with God, nothing will be impossible. God operates outside of what we are bound by. We worship the God of the impossible. And by impossible, I of course mean what is impossible for us, not what is impossible to God. God worked out a solution in both of these cases, an impossible, miraculous solution. He delivered Israel by dividing the sea and swallowing up their enemies behind them. That's impossible, isn't it? Just because the Israelites couldn't see how God would deliver them, he did. And similarly, he provided for his son's miraculous birth, even though Mary couldn't conceive of how she would conceive. Get it? <laughs> In both cases, God did the impossible because he said he would. So if God has done the impossible in the past, how about today? So my friend believed that it was important for her to complete her fast on the Day of Atonement, as we believe it's important, because we do it every year, and we believe that it's the commandment for us. And so my friend took this matter of fasting to God. It troubled her, and she wanted to be able to complete the fast. So she prayed about it. And after the Day of Atonement this year, she had a story to tell us. She did it. She fasted for the whole 24 hours and felt fine. And there's a funny little detail about this story that I thought you might appreciate. So she normally, of course, suffering from low blood sugar, she has a monitor that she can use to check her blood sugar throughout the day. And she had just gotten a brand new one that she was going to take to the feast this year. And during her fast, while she was starting to feel better than she had before and everything was going fine, she thought that she would take her blood sugar to see where it was at. And of course, it didn't work this time. The battery had sort of unexpectedly died and it didn't work. So she couldn't monitor her blood sugar that day, but she didn't need to. God answered her to prayer and she was able to make it through the fast feeling better than she had ever before. What inspired her to have this faith, to have this trust in God? Well, of course, it was a combination of things. She has a lifetime of faith. She's read these stories that we've read. But in particular, she had also heard a story from one of her friends who had been through a similar situation. When her friend was pregnant, she had gestational diabetes, which is a weird thing I learned about. Apparently, you can just be diabetic when you're pregnant. And just that period of time, that's, that's very strange. Um, but apparently, she had, one of her friends had this condition. And she also couldn't fast. But then she prayed about it, and she was able to. And so she told this story to my friend, who believed, and she prayed in the same way. Both of these women were given the evidence that they needed 
They had the faith to pray for something they knew wasn't physically possible for them. They had faith to believe that God could do the impossible in their lives if that was his will. And so they walked out in faith, and God worked miracles. Do we believe in the God of the impossible? Do we rely on God to do impossible things in our lives? Do we have faith that God will do the impossible again? I'll just read from Hebrews 12 and verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, this statement is the concluding remark to Hebrews chapter 11, which details and lists the champions of faith who are witnesses who also believed in the God of the impossible. And this chapter exists so that we too can believe in the God of the impossible. We can see the works that God has worked throughout the Bible. And the Bible is full of these stories of the God of the impossible. And all of these things together serve as our foundation for us to believe as well. And we need to have faith in God's abilities if we are to have faith for the fulfillment of his future promises and our salvation which are both impossible by human means alone. Again, when we say impossible, we mean impossible for us, not for God. Numbers 23 and verse 19 states the following. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and he will not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Numbers 23 and 19. These stories are evidence to the fact, to this fact, that we need to believe that God does not lie, and when God says, he will do. If we believe, then we can run the race and, sh and surely receive his promises, which we know are guaranteed. But we, only, we aren't only called to read the stories from the Bible. We are called to be here together and to encourage and inspire one another. And part of that is through being witnesses to one another, to share our stories with one another. Because just as the stories of the nation of Israel or of Mary's story build our faith, the stories we tell each other of our lives, like my friend or her friend, build our faith as well. So, what's your story? <laughs>